The Fed 15 podcast is presented by Serving Those Who Serve, a fiduciary fee-based financial planning firm serving federal government employees and retirees all over the country. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be taken as financial advice. All listeners should consult their personal advisors before taking any action. The opinions expressed by our hosts are their own and do not reflect the views, policies, or position of either Raymond James or Serving Those Who Serve. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Fed 15 podcast, of course, presented as always by Serving Those Who Serve. Now, each week, you know, my pal Dan and I here will be here to discuss the latest news and info that feds need to know in 15 minutes-ish or less. We're heavy on the ish on this podcast. So whether you're a seasoned federal employee or just starting out in your career, Fed 15 has got you covered. So grab your coffee, your green juice, your energy drink, your tea, if you're trying to be a little fancy, kick back and we'll tell you what you need to know, but might have missed over the past week. We are your hosts, Caitlin Murray. And of course, I'm joined- by Dan Sype and his pink shirt manifesting yes, over here. <laughs> I am manifesting. I'm putting this out into the universe because I know podcasts need to exist outside of time and space. But the reality is, uh, you know, we record, then our compliance department goes through it, and then we're able to post it. So by the time this goes up, we will have passed the date for the partial government shutdown. But I'm seeing progress there. So I'm not requiring it to happen before I go pink. I'm in the pink right now, so I am putting this all out into the universe. I have complete faith in our two houses that they're going to take care of our feds, and we're not going to have a shutdown, even if that means we're just pushing things out until March, where they can really dig in and do the work. So manifestations, manifestations, manifestations. Gotcha. I like it. I like it. Well, this week we've got a couple of interesting things. You know, we always like to kind of give you give you all the facts, the details, the deep dive on different facets of your federal financial life, right? So Dan is going to give us some really interesting information on Fegley, particularly honing in on option A. And we also wanted to kind of, so that's kind of a detail-oriented piece there, but we also have kind of a macro picture look because I find that financial planning is often a delicate balance between managing the details and then also, you know, keeping a good understanding of what that macro or what that global picture of your financial life looks like. So really interesting piece on the blog this week top five steps to improve your financial outlook. And now we don't talk about it a lot on the podcast, but folks who have worked with me at Serving Those Who Serve know that my background is really in financial psychology and behavioral finance. Um, in addition to being a certified financial planner, I also you know, have a graduate certificate in those kind of areas. And so I really think that the concept of a financial outlook is critical for our feds. I think, you know, it's a really important part of building a plan is having that outlook, is having those goals and kind of get taking stock of where you are. So with it still being January, because it is still January, we're hanging on to it by a thread, you know, it's a really good time to kind of take stock and kind of reevaluate your financial outlook, get a picture of the lay of the land. So sure. a couple steps that you can take to do that. The first is to create a net worth statement. So a net worth statement is really a picture, it's a snapshot in time of kind of where you are financially. So looking at basically your assets, so your TSP, your outside investment accounts, if you have a, an IRA or a Roth IRA, or maybe you know if you became a Fed later in your career, an old 401k or an old 403b from an old job. Looking at bank account balances, uh, if you've got CDs, if you've got I-bonds hanging around from 2022, all of those you know would factor into your investment assets. Then also look at the value of your home. Because the value of your home absolutely contributes to your net worth, even though it is an illiquid asset. So you want to take your total assets and then you want to identify all of your liabilities. So car loans, mortgages, if you've got student loans that are still hanging around, if you've got student loans for your kids, maybe parent plus loans that you took out, you want to calculate what the total of those liabilities are. And then you want to take your assets, subtract your liabilities, and that's how you get that net worth number. 
Now, your goal, obviously, is to have more assets than liabilities, but depending on where you are in your career, depending on what sort of things have happened, there's always you know unexpected things that can pop up and kind of take things off track a bit. But the goal is to have your assets outweigh your liabilities, and then you're in a position of having a positive net worth. So the net worth statement is a good start, but it is just a snapshot. You also want to check your first leave and earning statement of the new year. So double check for TSP deductions. How much are you putting into your TSP? Uh, If you are under 50, you can put $20,500 in this year. And if you are over 50, you get an additional $7,500 catch up contribution that you can make to that TSP this year. So double check where you are in your contributions. Look at your first deduction for, you know, off that first leave and earnings statement. Multiply it by 26. If you have 26 pay periods, 24. If you're on a 24 pay period schedule, most of our feds are on that 26 schedule. And see where you're kind of what you're on track to fund your TSP with this year. Are you on track to max out? If not, is there a way we can kind of bump that TSP contribution up just a smidge, knowing that we have, you know, that um, that salary increase coming? It's a really good time often to bump up those TSP contributions as much as you can. But you also want to look at FEHB premiums. You also want to look at HSA contributions if you are eligible for that, if you're in uh, an insurance plan that allows for that. And then also double check on those tax withholdings just to make sure, you know, if, if 2022 things were off a bit, you may have recalibrated in 2023, you know, it's a good time to kind of get a pulse check on that. You can also take a look at how much interest you paid in a previous year. So if you do have a mortgage, if you do have a car loan, January is often a good time to take a look at those year-end statements and just see interest paid year to date there. I will add as a caveat, so we're looking at kind of the liability side, how much interest you're paying on your loans to see if there's an opportunity maybe to refinance or consolidate. I would also do this with brokerage accounts that you have, bank accounts that you have. Take a look at your year-end statement and see how much interest they paid you last year. It might be surprising to you if you've got a, a significant sum of cash, how much an in interest you actually made. And it might be a good time to look at some higher yield vehicles sure. there. Another also, thing you want Caitlin, to do... Oh, go Caitlin. ahead, in that area, and yeah. I can't stress this enough, make sure you check any credit card statements. Yeah. Okay, because that's where the murderous interest lives. Yes. Uh, the, the best credit card interest rates are lousy. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll, I can have the hate mail coming from the banking industry any day now. The best rates are lousy, and now I'm going to get hate mail from uh, from the investment community. You can't invest well enough to outrun credit card interest. Okay. Uh, I can't do it. Caitlin can't do it. Nobody can do it. And it's sneaky. So everybody says, oh, I pay it off. But did you? Yeah. Okay. Did you pay it off after two months versus one month? So check that total interest paid at the end of that year. And in most cases, you're going to be surprised and possibly shocked how much that is because there's all these sneaky ways that it ends up that ends up growing there so sorry didn't mean no no that's a a really good point dan no it's very good point um taking a look at those credit card year-end statements could definitely be a uh an eye-opening experience. So another thing that you want to do, you want to track your expenses. So figuring out a solution for you that works for that. Now, I don't like to call these budgets. I like to call them spending plans because I think that reframing is helpful. But the big question that you want to answer is, how much will I need monthly to live the life I want to live once I stop working, right? Now, stop working could mean, you know, quit with the full-time job, take a position as a contractor. It could also mean take a part-time job in a less stressful. My example that I always use in client meetings is renting beach umbrellas, right? Because, you know, it's a great job. I would love to do that. And there's pretty, there's pretty minimal stress I would imagine involved in that. But typically you want to kind of figure, you want to have a mark for, you know, what that spending looks like for you in retirement. And you can work towards that in your financial planning. By the way, I'm not just talking to folks who are one to two to three years out from retirement with this. I am talking to the feds who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 
who are, you know, a long way off from retirement, having that goal to work towards is really pivotal in your financial planning. So figuring that out, very helpful. And then the last thing that you want to take a look at is check that TSP. I know we talked about looking at the leave and earning statements to figure out where we are contribution wise, but what is your allocation in the TSP? How are you invested? Are you too aggressive? Are you too conservative? Has the market moved since the last time you rebalanced your TSP? Ideally, you want to take a look at that TSP at least once a year to see if you need to rebalance but potentially, if it's been a couple years since you set up your allocation, you may need to actually change the allocation, not just rebalance. And then the other thing for our folks who have attained or will be attaining the age of 50 this year, catch up contributions. That extra 7,500 that you can put in per year to the TSP, you know, once you have that birthday and it's a big birthday, you know, you can, you can put a little extra money in. So you may think you're maxing, but you, if you've turned 50, then you've kind of hit the catch up contribution era. So you want to make sure you're, sure you're taking advantage of that. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Caitlin, that's all great stuff. You know, thanks, Jen Meyer and Ben Fitzben for, uh, for getting this out there. You can read this on our site. And this is something we're really proud of, folks, because if you want to, you know, look, yes, we have a full service fiduciary financial planning group. And if you want to talk about that, we're thrilled, but it's not a requirement. And we meticulously and specifically reinvest to produce this type of content for every single Fed everywhere. So if you're of a mind to do it yourself, we want to make sure you have the tools. But also, just to let you know, if you get a number of years down the road doing that and you decide you'd like a partner, we're happy to have that conversation. But we are super proud of the fact that we're putting out this type of content that kind of walks you through the steps of take care of it yourself. So great job, Caitlin. Oh, thank you. We love it. We love a mid episode applause. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. So, well, you have some interesting information for us on Fagley. So we sort of looked at the forest and now we're going to drill down into a particular tree. Exactly. Exactly. So I, I think pretty much everybody in federal service knows or should know that you have the Federal Employee Group Life Insurance Program and it's broken into two primary components basic life and optional coverages. A uh, quick recap, basic life is your salary around the next highest thousand plus 2000. It's a level premium over the course of your career, meaning there's no scheduled increases for age. If they change the whole cost for the program, that's the only way they change it. Well, then the very next one in order is option A, which is also called standard option. And it's a flat amount of $10,000. Now, through the years, I've had a lot of people say, why is this even there? Because remember, you also have option B, which is a multiple of up to five times. So that's meaningful money. But this little one's sitting there at $10,000. Why does this even exist? Caitlin, would you like to, would you like to guess? Well, I don't know if I can guess because I, I sort of know. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I'm a good litmus test for it. Okay. Well, that if, that if you know, why is there a $10,000? So my understanding, and I may be, you know, I say I know, but I may be incorrect. My understanding is that when this was rolled out, it was a long time ago and $10,000 actually was meaningful money in yep. the 1950s. And it wasn't, we didn't build in an inflation sort of bump up with this. It was just kind of a flat 10 grand. And rather than kind of revising that or changing it, we just sort of tacked on BC coverage. Is that Spot Did I pass on. the test? Yep, absolutely. Yep. <laughs> Good. At, at the time this was rolled out, ten thousand could have been a home mortgage. Yeah. Ten ten thousand could have been more than well the multiple of basic. So yep. it's a little bit of an anachronism, but it's definitely there. Okay. So it has some similarities to to both basic and the other options. It increases in cost every five years, like the other options. But it has an accidental death and dismemberment provision built into it, just like basic does, which means if God forbid something happens to you by accident, it pays twice. Dismemberment, nobody ever talks about it. It's a holdover from the industrial era. It's, you know, and, and it has grisly definitions. It's like, yeah. you know, loss of a hand of a hand and a foot or a hand and an eye or something like that. It pays out the full amount. It doesn't happen that often, but when it does, you're, you're glad you have it. Uh, again, stair steps up, so it's less expensive when you're younger, more expensive 
when you're older. However, like basic and unlike the other options, you do have the ability to keep 25% of it for free in retirement. So if you've maintained it for at least five years before you retire, you can have a 75% reduction and you keep 25% of it forever. It's something. And you know, reduces at 2% per month until it hits the 25%. Unlike the basic, you don't have the ability, or un- unlike the basic or the option B, you don't have the ability to pay something and just keep it going. Right. Okay. It's kind of a fun little unit in there. Generally, it tends to exist in a place where people have checked every box. Right. You know, so they came in this item. Oh, yeah, I'll grab that. I'll grab that. I'll grab that. So right. just keep in mind if you've been paying for it and you're within five years of retirement, you may want to consider keeping it. Yeah. Because again, it's an extra $2,500 that'll be there for the family. So yeah. it's kind of the forgotten option in there. So it's just one of those I places like that. where it makes it very intriguing. Option A, the forgotten option. <laughs> yeah. Well, We'll go with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll workshop it. We'll workshop it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I think that covers everything. I think that's yeah. all the time we have today. But have no fear. We'll be back next week to bring you the latest updates you need to make informed decisions about your career and financial well-being as a Fed. We pride ourselves on the fact that here and on the website, we want to have tremendous content in there. So if you're doing stuff yourself, if you're an I can do it, Okay, it's there. But if you're help me through it, we're here for you as well. So exactly. Yep. Exactly. And guys, do be sure to subscribe to our podcast either on our YouTube channel called Fed Life or on Spotify so that you never miss an episode with us. And please do remember to share it with your friends and colleagues. It's a really kind of low commitment way to keep up on what's going on in the world of uh, federal benefits. And for more information about the topics covered today, And more, be sure to check out our blog at blog.stwserve.com. Subscribe to our newsletter, The Weekly Serving. So we're going to ship all this stuff to you. It'll land right in your inbox. You don't have to go looking for it. Latest stuff you need for all feds, delivered straight to the inbox every single week. Absolutely. And for those who want to dive even deeper into learning about your federal benefits and financial planning for feds, we do encourage you to join us for one of our complimentary webinars. Uh, We have the FERS webinar, Understanding Your FERS uh, Benefits, coming up on February 1st. And then we have a tax planning webinar coming up on February 8th. If you've never joined us for the tax planning webinar, I really do encourage you to join for that one um, because there's a lot of really helpful, very actionable, Uh, information in there. Of course, if you prefer a one-on-one approach, feel free to reach out to our team directly for a financial planning consultation. You can do that by emailing us at askstws at stwserve.com. Perfect. Well, thanks for listening to the Fed 15. I'm Dan Seip. And I'm Caitlin Murray. And we will see you next week. See you next week.